Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at Synopsys with Burkhard Hunke, who's going to talk today about disruption in the automotive industry. Burkhard, as we start moving down the road toward autonomous vehicles and more assisted driving, there's a lot more electronics coming into cars. It's a different way of thinking about how cars are designed. What sort of impact is this having, both in terms of the electronics industry, what we're doing on our side, on the chip side, as well as uh, among the car makers? I think it requires a comprehensive design approach. Um, you have to design uh, reliability, security, and safety from SOC into the next layer, ECU, and then system and vehicle. And this comprehensive design requires a thinking and collaboration uh, approach in between the different industry players. But these are worlds that typically have not gone together at all in the past, right? You think about the electronics that were in cars going back five years ago, it was pretty much just actuators and uh, pretty basic MCUs. Yeah, I think uh, we can learn from the smartphone industry. Uh, this has happened uh, decades ago. Uh, how do you get updates over the air? How do you do the upgradability uh, uh, continuously to keep your product fresh, for instance? This can be learned from the smartphone industry. And even the workflow, including modeling and simulation, um, this uh, can be learned from the smartphone in industry in this as well. Why don't you draw this out for us? Sure. So what's your vision for how to unite these two pieces? How do they go together? So first of all, we have to understand how cars are being developed uh, these days. So it usually takes approximately four and a half years to develop a car. That usually begins in the concept phase, um, and then uh, the concept decision is being made uh, approximately 36 months before start of production. Um, that means uh, the development process goes close to 12 months before start of production and then it's just preparing uh, the production line to ramp up uh, the, the uh, volume of the car. So you develop for three years and everything what comes into the car has to be developed in the concept phase up front. Then afterwards the car usually runs maybe seven years on average in the, uh, in, in the same uh, way. And then uh, the cars are getting into the end of production after uh, maybe uh, seven years. So the question is, how does the semiconductor industry fit into this model? Well, we can talk about the tape out uh, frequency. And if you say, well, one car is being taped out, taped out after four and a half years, how often do you get new processes uh, in at the same time? And usually it takes 18 months per uh, SOC to uh, get to the tape out phase that means three tape outs while you do one car how do you get that synchronized so if you do the concept phase first and say well this is the time actually when i have to design the architecture of the, of the soc i have to do the spec and architecture of the soc if I know the functional requirements, then I have to design the architecture of the SOC. And then I begin with the design of the SOC and I can now use all the methodologies uh, which we are known from the, uh, which we, we, we know from the semiconductor world, uh, co-designing hardware software, providing already models of the SOC, bringing these models into the development of the next layer, the ECUs, and uh, run uh, the software simulation on the separated model. One thing that's very different from what happened in the, the smartphone industry, for example, is that if they didn't get it right, they figured, okay, in two years, they will be able to change it. And there is some software upgradability that's coming into these chips. But now we're, we're looking at designing chips that are supposedly going to be defect-free for 18 years. Is that even possible? Do the two sides need to find some uh, common ground here? And if so, how do they get there? Yeah, uh, definitely uh, they have to find uh, a common understanding what's required. Number one, uh, we have already uh, IP um, which can be implemented to observe and monitor continuously the function, the full function of the SOCs. That is a requirement number one, it's a must have. If you have this little laboratory implemented into your SLC design, you can monitor continuously over lifetime what's happening to your device. 
Of course, you cannot change the hardware performance, but we don't see, let's say, smartphones uh, for 10 years, 15 years. So you have to see updates. And I think we will uh, also experience updates in regards to hardware in the near future. But let's say um, hardware is constant, for, the, for first of all. Uh, we need to ensure that a channel is uh, opened uh, to update continuously software. The upgradability uh, continuously over the air, that's required to keep your car fresh and uh, up to date, including functions and features, but also in regards to security updates, you have to update that uh, constantly uh, over a uh, lifetime. One of the requirements of ISO 26262 is that if something fails, there is a replacement part. It may not even be the same replacement part by the same vendor, but there has to be a backup, right? That, that is right. So you have to be able to uh, maintain continuously and upgrade uh, or uh, exchange parts uh, over lifetime. And you need to know exactly what kind of hard and software couple you have used uh, to implement and uh, the right piece and uh, uh, change the right piece at, at the right time. As you're updating all the software, as you're upgrading the firmware, does the functionality of that change, does it still work with other systems in a car and even other systems in other cars that you may be communicating with? It has to, it has to be tested and released. And this process is uh, uh, a very well established process which runs through a simulation, modeling, simulation, and then release process to ensure that the functionality, fully functionality across the different domain controllers is still working uh, properly. This is a challenge, but uh, the setup is required and you need to help uh, the industry uh, to provide the right models in the simulation environment to uh, continuously uh, launch and release software over the lifetime of the product. So typically when you have an industry that's been around for a while, you build silos. Those silos are very good at improving the efficiency of whatever you're trying to do. The problem is they don't last as long as they used to, and the ones that exist now sometimes get in the way of what you're trying to do with a brand new approach to whatever you're trying to design. What happens between in the auto industry and also in the electronics industry, and what has to be broken down and reconfigured? Yeah. I think a uh, key issue is sometimes just the language, right? Although you speak the same language, uh, the content is so different. Um, let's say uh, automotive industry is driven by functional requirements. Uh, how do you translate that into a specification of a semiconductor? It requires uh, a common approach. It, uh, it requires, uh, let's say, a cooperation model. You have to talk at the earliest phase and the concept phase together with the semiconductors. What do I need in my car? What kind of function am I going to launch in four and a half years? What's the next function? Next function. So you have to discuss it and define it exactly in a roadmap along your lifetime of the product. And I think that's the key. Uh, the industries have to approach each other. They have to learn from both sides. And I think this is going to be a very successful collaboration model of the future uh, to launch uh, the right products for the customers. Do they have to keep going back to that concept phase though? So yes, it does take four and a half years to five years to design a car, but your security has to be built in way up front. You have to have an architecture for that. A lot of times security changes on an even faster basis than some of these other things. I think uh, the basis is uh, definitely has to be defined in the architecture phase. Uh, if you can build in a uh, uh, root of trust uh, um, uh, gates or locks uh, in the IP and you have to root it through the systems up to the vehicle. Um, and while you launch it, you have to protect it continuously. So you have to be able to update continuously. Yes, uh, this is required. Uh, usually uh, we will see um, that open source is becoming more and more relevant. So you have to protect continuously the uh, soft and hardware uh, couples against the security and that requires specific testing points and, and reports which have to be provided uh, over a lifetime. So as you design IP that goes into these systems, what else do you have to keep in mind? It's not just building a block anymore, it's now building a block that's going to interface with other blocks that may be under even extreme conditions, right? Yeah, I see, um, let's say a key enabler in the future is going to be a subsystem of, of some functionality built in already into the IP of, of an SOC. 
uh, let's say a, subsy a subsystem is uh, a safety relevant uh, subsystem which takes care of all these ASL requirements. It's a security subsystem which takes care of all the hacking uh, possibilities in the interfaces around the SOC design but also in the upper uh, level of the system and, and vehicle design. So those uh, designs have to be implemented up front. There's no chance uh, to change uh, architectural uh, aspects later on. So you have to think through it uh, uh, constantly and if changes are required, you have to change the hardware. Uh, so I think architectural phase is key. So you have to implement IP, which uh, helps to increase security, safety, and reliability upfront. Has it been an easy transition pushing some of the electronic design into the architecture phase at automotive companies? It definitely has uh, always been a challenge. Usually there has been the discussion uh, debate in between uh, OEM and Tier 1 and they have implemented that on the ECU level. So that's a multi-SOC board level. Uh, uh, this is uh, changing by now. It has been a uh, uh, long-term relationship in between those uh, players. But the requirements in regards to uh, performance, in regards to low power, low energy, the, the optimization of the design for SOCs which are uh, low power, low uh, current consuming and at the same time high performing in regards to calculation power. This has to be designed into very early, earlier than the board. It has to be on the SOC level and that's a changing aspect. Um, I would name it shift left. Uh, number one is, is uh, you, you have to use the methodologies of semiconductors in the modeling and simulation world, but shift two is actually automotive is designing SOCs, and that's a, that's a key changer uh, in the future of automotive. So what's going to bridge these two worlds? Is it going to be the chips that are going to bridge the two worlds? Is it going to be the car makers that are going to bridge these two worlds, the uh, tier ones? Who becomes the glue in all this whole process? I think uh, I see us as, a, as an uh, advocate and, and uh, catalyst uh, to help to bring all these pieces together. But I think it requires a multi uh, um, uh, people engagement or multi-company uh, engagement to really optimize those uh, workflows. Uh, it requires a clear design, uh, a workflow design for security, safety and reliability. And I think this design flow, uh, workflow has to be designed together. So I think uh, it requires um, a lot of discussions, uh, lot, uh, requires a cooperation model, it's, it requires also a rethinking of automotive um, four and a half years before you launch something on the on the road uh, you have to thought through the entire functional uh, catalog that is new I think uh, usually it uh, takes a little longer but that's required to design uh, most sophistic uh, processor into your uh, car and that's a pacemaker for innovations in automotive in the future Four and a half years from now, we're going to be working at probably three nanometers as opposed to seven nanometers. Does this mean that we're going to start seeing three nanometer chips in cars? It's important to get to a higher density, a package uh, density, because you need the low energy. You need the uh, uh, low um, waste uh, e energy in regards to thermal effects and so on. So yes, uh, higher packaging. Uh, is required to get the uh, required uh, current consumption down and at the same time the performance up. Uh, we will definitely see a move into this direction and since it's uh, really financially uh, uh, very intense, uh, it requires an, a clear understanding upfront what's required and this is uh, more or less uh, required in the discussion in between the different partners. Uh, what do you expect? Uh, since uh, it's cost intensive. Uh, it requires a very clear definition book at the beginning. Burkhard Hunke, thanks for a great explanation, and this is going to be a really interesting field to follow. Thank you very much.